listen only mode. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network. And on this webinar, we also have uh, Nick Weiner from OpenChannels.org who is uh, co-moderating with me. And we're so happy you can all be here today. It's going to be a great presentation. Today we have Juan Carlos Villasenor Derbez from the Brin School of Environment environmental science and management at the U University of California, Santa Barbara, who's going to be speaking about a general approach and tool to evaluate the effectiveness of no-take marine reserves. And we're very uh, happy that Juan Carlos can be here. He has a lot of co-authors who will introduce, but um, Juan Carlos will be giving the presentation. Uh, so the way this is going to work is Juan Carlos will be speaking with us for uh, about half an hour and we'll have the rest of the remaining time for questions. Um, we definitely encourage questions um, and you can send them in through the question interface or the question panel, the user interface. There's a little section that says questions. So you can go ahead and type them in. You can send questions or comments. Um, and if you have any technical difficulties, um, you can also send those the information about that in too. Um, when we get to the question and answer portion, I will moderate the questions. Uh, I'll read them to Juan Carlos. Um, and so since they're sort of held, you can go ahead and send in questions throughout the webinar, even during the presentation, it, it won't disturb us, but uh, and it would be great to have them when we're ready to go for the Q&A. So feel free to send in questions at any point that they come to you. Um, and we look forward to the interactive portion at the end. Okay, uh, Juan Carlos, I will turn it over to you now. All right, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me well and it's not gonna have a lot of internet connection problems. Uh, so yeah, my name is Juan Carlos Villasenor. I am going to be presenting today on this uh, huge effort, uh, the result of a huge effort uh, of a great team composed with uh, Cayo Faro, Melena Wright, and Jael Martinez. We were the core team of students that worked in this project with a lot of support from our PhD uh, student advisor, uh, Sean Fitzgerald, people from Comunidad y Biodiversidad, that's an NGO in Mexico that was Stuart Fulton, uh, Alvin Suarez, and Jorge Torre and as well as Mar Mancha from Arizona State University and Gavin McDonald from the Sustainable Fisheries Group at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, and of course, uh, the help from Pio Michele and Christopher Costello from Stanford at UC Santa Barbara. Um, I am going to be presenting today, but I hope that throughout the presentation, you come up with some good questions. Uh, as Sarah said, just send them along and hopefully by the end of the presentation, we'll have a good set of questions that we can go along. All right. Well, I'm going to try to use this little laser pointer and hopefully it's not going to be very distracting. So before we get into this general approach that, that we're going to be presenting, uh, I just want to leave clear that whenever we say or when I say marine reserves, I'm referring to the to what IUCN categorizes as type 1A or 1B or what the uh, MPA index proposed by Orte Costa categorizes as something lower than three. And these are uh, strongly enforced and strongly protected marine protected areas. And of course we know uh, as marine protected areas, uh, they usually increase biomass, increase density, size of fish or, or, or other organisms and richness. And some of the benefits are, well, there's increased in biomass and the number of organisms, uh, preserving biodiversity, providing some climate change resilience and somewhat debatable, but it's worth mentioning the benefit to fisheries. So uh, the motivation for this work was Mexico, because we were working with uh, Comunidad de Biodiversidad, which is a, a marine conservation and sustainable fisheries uh, NGO that works in Mexico. And uh, this was part of the fishing refugia. Uh, this fishing refugia is uh, basically a legal framework in which fishers can propose to implement a no-take marine reserve within their fishing grounds to the government. And it's, uh, in the end, it's just a no-take marine reserve, but it's proposed with a very a nice bottom-up approach and the law for that has not a lot of information on how to design this fishing refugia uh, but we know about this we know we have design principles that have been largely thought before uh, it provides very good guidelines for implementation of it all the legal process who to contact how to involve people in the process it provides somewhat some information about the monitoring of this uh, fishing refugia or this type of marine reserves but in the end, it provides no information on how to evaluate the effectiveness of these marine reserves. 
And this is a little bit troubling because they have an expiration date. Since uh, they're proposed by, uh, by fishers, they usually have an expiration date of three or four years or whatever the features feel like having. And when that expiration date comes, fishers need to submit evidence that the reserve has been working or that it has not been working in order to redesign it or reestablish it. And this uh, little step in here posed some little problems. Uh, for example, there's the how is UNPA doing framework by the IUCN, and it's a great job that Pomeroy and collaborators have put together. However, uh, in places where capacity is not in place, this was not enough. It provides a great list of indicators and some information on how to analyze them, but it doesn't really make it accessible to people that are not trained in, in, in this uh, evaluation of marine reserves and, and all these science parts. And this leads us to uh, our two main objectives for this project. The first part was to develop a general approach to evaluate no take marine reserves. And uh, while it was focused in Mexico, I, I think you'll see that it can be applied elsewhere. Uh, but we didn't want to do just that because we would end up with the same thing, just a framework and a set of instructions and a list of indicators, but that's not really scalable, replicable, and accessible. So our second objective was to create user-friendly tools to perform this evaluation, making all our framework accessible and replicable. So for the first part of it, um, we needed to identify the objectives for which reserves were established because we wanted to know, well, what are the management objectives for which a reserve has been established and what indicators can we use to measure those objectives? So after reviewing all the, uh, the technical documentation in, for Mexico, and this included decrees, uh, agreements, and everything that was published in official sites, all the management plans and all this information, we extracted and categorized, let's say, a, a set of seven main objectives. And I've just outlined them here in a different color because some of them are a little bit more economically focused, like recover species of commercial interest. And some of them are more uh, ecologically focused, like preserve biodiversity and the ecosystem. Nonetheless, these are the seven main categories that we decided to go forward with. And that encompassed most of the, or, or all the objectives that we were able to extract. And I'm sure, uh, these are general enough that you can link uh, some of the objectives you may have in mind into each of these. And now, as I said, we wanted to match these objectives to indicators. And so what we did is we came up with this list of indicators and we divided them into biophysical or biological indicators. And this include things like total fish biomass or natural disturbance. That's just like a descriptive uh, narrative about natural disturbances that have occurred in the zone. We also have socioeconomic indicators, and we look into these socioeconomic indicators through uh, landings of species of interest and the income that these landings uh, produce. And we also included things like alternative economic opportunities or livelihoods. And lastly, we have a list of governance indicators, and these allow us to understand how the community is structured, uh, under which uh, rules and regulations do they operate, and might provide us insights into what things could be improved or changed. And of course, the original list was probably four times longer than this or five times longer than this. And it was trimmed and adjusted and, and filtered by presenting it to fishers and fishing communities along Baja California uh, in, in Mexico, uh, to a set of managers and academics. And some of the most important points was to, to have in mind where, especially for the biophysical indicators, well, yes, we would like to have some indicator of, let's say, larval dispersal. But if that indicator did not exist for the baseline of the site that were already in Mexico, we had to dispose of that because of the analysis that we're gonna do. And I'm gonna uh, go into that in, in a bit. But basically one of the criteria was, is there baseline data for that indicator? Uh, can we, still collect that data on a yearly basis for the reserve and the control sites and uh, also whatever the fishers and the managers and the academics thought was uh, made sense to to include um, so I've, I've outlined that this list of indicators but i think we need to make a little pause and talk about where these indicators come from 
And this is our probably simplistic view of a fishing community or a coastal community. And we have the biophysical component, the socioeconomic component, and the governance component. And we see sort of how people in this side are linked to the ocean and the resources through the socioeconomic part of it. And so our view for the biophysical data is that there are these reserve sites and they have a control site. And these are very similar in habitat. They are surveyed every year by trained divers. And the only difference between them is that one of them has fishing pressure and one of them doesn't. And so this, this trained divers are usually fishers from the fishing communities that have been trained as scientific divers that follow standardized reef check protocols or agra protocols. Uh, and they, they have this bucky sampling design, this is a before after control impact. Uh, and this means that before the reserve was implemented, at least one year before, they surveyed the reserve and control sites. Based on that information, they designated one of them as a reserve and one of them as a control site. And every year thereafter, they continued to survey these sites. And the surveys are usually uh, visual census of fish and invertebrate species. Uh, where they record richness, abundances, and sizes uh, for fish. So this provides us with our two data sets, the fish data set and the invertebrate data set uh, for the biophysical indicators. Now for the socioeconomic part of it, uh, as I said, we're looking into the income and the landings uh, that produce that income. And there are three main sources, and I think this applies to most countries, at least in Mexico and Latin, Latin America. Uh, you can find this, uh, information either through government agencies, uh, directly within the fishing communities. If they're well organized, they tend to have a good uh, reporting and a good uh, record of how much have they produced and how much money that, that has generated for them. And also some NGOs have really good um, fishing or biological monitoring programs that record this information. And in our case, we're uh, using information generated by the community. Then uh, for the governance part of it, uh, there's no standardized way to, to record that information as, for example, the, the bio biological side of it that's recorded every year. So in this case, we designed uh, a survey that can be applied either to a random member of the community or to community leaders, and that's a more in-depth survey, uh, to pick up some information about their perceptions of different things and uh, a descriptive uh, analysis or description description of uh, some of the set of rules that uh, under which the community operates. And so this uh, three parts gives us the four data sets that we need to do the evaluation. We have a fish data set, an invertebrate data set, socioeconomic, and governance data. But how are we going to analyze this? Well, uh, taking advantage of the uh, backy design that we have for the biophysical indicators, we can use a difference in difference analysis. And this allows, you, allows us to go uh, one step further from correlation and actually talk about causation or causality and estimate the net effect of the reserve. And we use a multiple linear regression model like this, where each indicator, let's say fish biomass, can be explained by uh, a y-intercept. And then we have uh, um, some coefficients for the year, and the year is modeled as a factor, with the first year being the reference level, and this, uh, what this means basically is that we don't assume that the change between, let's say, 2010 and 2011 has to be the same as the change between 2015 and 2016. So we, we release uh, or we reduce the overimposition of a linear structure by doing this. Then we have a coefficient for the zone, and that is a dummy variable where it's a zero if the zone is a control site and a one if it is a reserve site. And we have an interaction term between a variable called post, and that basically it's a zero if it's before the implementation and a one if it's after the implementation of the reserve. And we interact that variable with the zone again, the zero for control and one for reserve. And it's this, this beta three coefficient, that is what's going to tell us what was the net effect of the reserve uh, as compared to the control site through time, because we're controlling for the temporal variable here and the zonal or the treatment variable here. And of course, uh, usually the, the, the environment is quite variable. And even though we have replicates of transects in each site, uh, there is still some variability, but we can account for that variability by including some covariates. And it's in a separate line, but it's all the same model. 
Uh, so while the, the, the fishers or the divers are performing the underwater transects, they usually record things like water temperature, visibility along the transect, and depth at which the transect was performed. And we include that information into the model, uh, trying to adjust or account for these, uh, these variations that could be induced by these variables. And so this is the model that we use for the biophysical indicators. Now, for the socioeconomic indicators, we don't have a control site. So we cannot use causal inference techniques. A control site would be a community that is exactly the same in every aspect, or at least very similar, uh, but that doesn't have the research. And that is just, it's by the nature of this uh, indicator that it's just not possible. But we can still extract some useful information out of uh, the, 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 the data that we have for the socioeconomic indicators. And we do a simple linear regression where we regress uh, the value indica on the, of the indicator on the post variable. And that's basically comparing what's the mean value of before to the mean value of after the implementation of the reserve. And uh, in the case of uh, income that is adjusted for, for inflation inside Marea, so you don't need to, to worry about adjusting that. And finally, for the governance part, which is even more abstract and, and sometimes harder to deal with, uh, what we came up with was this, uh, this framework or this idea that uh, we can understand what the impacts are of each choice, per se. So, for example, if the perception of the degree of illegal fishing were to be high, we would recommend to improve surveillance and then uh, call this like a, a red light or a warning message of what could happen. And we did this uh, sort of decision tree or a decision table based on uh, a literature review of identifying which uh, governance structures or which decisions had usually a positive impact or a negative impact. And of course, again, we cannot infer causal inference and can say that just by changing the value of an indicator or changing it, or modifying it, sorry, uh, it will actually work but it's at least uh, some information that might be valuable in the management process. And so in order to make available all this information, uh, the first step was developing this guidebook. And the guidebook runs the user through the very first steps of identifying the objectives of your memory reserve, matching those with indicators uh, that you want to use to measure the, the effectiveness, how to collect data and we have some guidelines or point the users into more specific uh, resources on how to collect the data but we also provide formatting guidelines because in the end if you're going to use marea which is an app you need to have your data properly formatted and we have formatting guidelines in there uh, and we have examples on how to run the evaluation and this guidebook is, is available in spanish and in english and i've included here some uh, tiny url uh, sort of thing so you can look for that um, if i switch too fast before you can copy that or anything uh, this presentation is going to be recorded or you can contact me later and i'm happy to share this information with you so we had our guidebook but that guidebook in the end was just going to be uh, sitting on someone's desk accumulating dust so we need we needed an extra step to actually make it easy uh, for people to implement this, and especially for fishers to implement this. So we decided to develop MAREA, and MAREA stands for Marine Reserve Evaluation App. It is a Shiny app that you can find in at turfeffect.shinyapps.io slash MAREA. And uh, a Shiny app is basically an, uh, an app that is developed within R Studio and R. And uh, the, the great thing about this is that it's an open source application that anybody can use and log into. Uh, and so long as you have internet connection and the correctly formatted data, uh, you can just run your analysis. And I'm going to try and do a demonstration of this app right now. So I'm going to switch screens uh, into the app and hopefully the webinar won't crash. Let me go for that. Okay. So I am running this locally in my computer just straight from, from R. Uh, because I don't want to, uh, I use a lot of internet uh, band right now, but uh, it, it's gonna, won't, going to work exactly the same. So once you log into the app uh, and it loads in your screen, this is what you'll see. You'll see a sidebar that has some resources 
and six main tabs. And as you can see, this is right now in Spanish, and this is because, well, he developed in, in Spanish, uh, and it's intended to for Mexico. But we've included this little uh, Google Translate widget, and you can translate to any other uh, language you want to translate. And since I'm running it locally, I'm not going to do that right now because I, I would need to be running it on the server uh, at shinyapps.io slash marea. Uh, but you guys can go ahead and do that whenever you're using it. And so in this sidebar, we've included some resources. The first is a link to our user guide. It's a sneak peek on how to use the, the app with a brief example. We have a link to our Turf Effect group project webpage that you can uh, keep track of what we're doing. Uh, we've included an access format to record the governance data. And this is basically because the, the survey for governance has a lot of, of, of questions. And in order to make sure everything was standardized, well, we developed this, or Cayo, I would must say, uh, developed this uh, access form uh, that you can automatically input all the governance uh, uh, answers from the survey. Uh, here is our email. You can contact us here if there's any trouble with the app, any bugs you see, uh, something's not running, that's where you do it. And here, this little square right here, it says share data or compartir datos. Uh, that's basically because if you, the user wants, uh, they can choose to share their data with us. And what this does is any, every time somebody uses the app, it will be collecting the data about marine reserves throughout Mexico, Latin America, and hopefully the world, and storing them in a publicly accessible uh, repository of marine reserve information. And if you don't want to share that uh, information because you're uh, working on, on, on some data that you don't want to share, you can just go ahead and unclick that. And even if you forget to unclick it uh, when you're using it, so long as you don't provide uh, an email here, it won't share the, 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 the data with us. So I'm going to go ahead and just unclick it for now and hide the sidebar. And as I said, we have six main tabs, and we can navigate through them by clicking directly on the tab or using the next and back arrows. And that's sort of how we work through our, our steps. And we have the, the steps that I have found. Uh, we select objectives and indicators, then we upload the data. We uh, select a reserve and the information that we want to analyze, and then a confirmation tab, and then you'll get your results. So let's go ahead and do a small uh, walk through this. Here on the left side, you have the objectives. And uh, these are the, the, the seven objectives that I presented to you earlier. And you can see that as soon as I click on one of the objectives, automatically indicators are selected. And this is because we think that these indicators are supposed or, or must be used to analyze that objective. And you can keep selecting different objectives and that will just add indicators on top of that. And uh, the fact that one objective doesn't take one indicator Another, another one does means that it's going to trump it. Uh, they just keep adding themselves. And if for some reason you don't want to include some indicators, let's say I don't want to do uh, Shannon's diversity index nor richness, and I'm also not interested in alternative livelihoods nor uh, the size of the reserve, you could manually modify that based on what you really want to do uh, if you don't want to follow the, the suggestions, and you're totally free to, to do that. Then uh, on the next tab, you're going to upload your data. And as I said, the, the guidebook that we have written for you guys in English and Spanish contains information on how to format these data sets so that they can be read uh, by Maria. And it's a very simple formatting. Uh, they just need to be exported into CSV, and the column names need to be a little bit specific. But we've included examples in here. And you can click on any of these buttons and download sample data sets for fish, invertebrate, socioeconomic data, and governance data. So I'm going to go ahead right now and start uploading the fish data set. I'm also going to load the invertebrate data set, socioeconomic, and governance data sets. Now, this is running really fast because I'm running it in my computer. If you're running it uh, online, it might take a couple seconds to, to load that data. That depends on your internet connection. And what Maria will do is give you a little uh, preview of your data in here. So you can see, well, this is my fish data. Yes, it's well uh, formatted. These are the correct columns. This is actually what I want to be using. The same for invertebrate, socioeconomic, and governance, right? So once we've uploaded all our data, we can just go ahead and click Next. 
and select the reserve. And what Marea is doing, it's, uh, let me go back real fast. So it's using this community or comunidad uh, column to identify all the available communities within the data set that I've loaded. I could have loaded a data set that has three communities and three reserved for each community just because I happen to be lucky enough to have all that data. In this case, it only has Isla Natividad, and that's an island in the Mexican Pacific, uh, sort of in the middle uh, of the Baja Peninsula. And within Isla Natividad, um, Marea identifies that there are two marine reserves, and that's La Plano de las Cuevas, with its control site, La Dulce and Babencho, and Punta Prieta and Guanera. And this NA value here, it's just because the data set happens to have an extra site that it's neither a reserve nor a control site, it's just another monitoring site. And so I can select this in here. And based on the site that I select, Marea will also identify all the available species for which I can run analysis uh, for, for, for this particular location. And this means that the species is present in both the control site and the reserve site, but also that it is present before and after the implementation of the reserve. And uh, this list of species is directly extracted from the data sets that I uploaded. And so what I need to input here is the year of implementation. And I know that the reserves in Isla Natividad were implemented in 2006. So I just type that in. Uh, you can also use these little arrows to go up or down and uh, select the objective species. Now, uh, the, I know that the objective species for Isla Natividad were things like, for example, Pandolirus interruptus, that is the spiny lobster, and Parasticopus parvimensis, that is the, um, the sea cucumber. And we could also uh, select, for example, for example the, the red sea urchin that has now been changed to another taxonomic group, but it's the same organism. Then I go ahead and click Next, and I get to the Confirmation tab. And this Confirmation tab tells me the analysis will be generated for the La Plana Las Cuevas and La Dulce Babencho uh, Marine Reserve in Isla Natividad. So it's just sort of like a make sure you clicked on what you wanted to click. And then we, we, we have, again, all the objectives that I selected, the indicators that I selected for the biophysical, socioeconomic, and governance. And once I'm sure that this is what I want, I can go ahead and click Next. And a good thing about this, this how the app works, is that even if I happen to realize here, like, oh, I selected landings, and I didn't want to select landings, I need to start over. You don't. You don't need to, like, reload the app and load all your data again. You can just go back at any point to any tab, on select an indicator that you don't want to use, probably select one that you wanted to use or something like that, and simply go back to the confirmation page. Everything is updated. Landings is not here anymore. Richness is here now. And you can go ahead and go to the results tab. And within a couple seconds, you get your results. Of course, if you're on the internet, this might take a little bit more uh, because it's it is running one uh, multiple linear regression for each indicator uh, for all the data that we have. So it, it depends on how how good of an internet connection you have, but it's usually less than 10 seconds. And what you see here, it's the four main scores that we use in the scorecard. The first part of it is the global score, and that is the percent of positive indicators overall, and that's from the indicator that you selected. Uh, then you have a, a general score for biophysical indicators, a general score for socioeconomic, and a general score for governance indicators. And as well, this depends on the number of positive indicators within each category. And if we want to see more information uh, about each indicator, we can just click these buttons here that will display all the indicators that are available uh, within the data and the, the analysis. And I'm sorry that some of the letters come out of the squares. Uh, this happens because of the uh, webinar sharing thing. Um, but this is how it would look like. And as you can see, for example, here we have fish richness, and we have uh, small letters in here that say the effect and the p-value of that. And as you can see, we have different colors. So let me go up and explain why these colors appear like that. So for the biophysical indicators, uh, the colors are defined based on the beta 3 coefficient or the difference in difference coefficient or estimate uh, that we that we obtained. And basically, if that estimate is negative, you'd be on this side of the color range. And if it's positive, you'd be on this side. And a negative means that as compared to the control site, through time, the reserve underperformed. 
And uh, positive values mean that as compared to the control side, through time, the reserve uh, was uh, having an increase or higher value. And the, the intensity of these colors, it's defined by the, by the significance of that coefficient. So you can have things that are red, uh, that would be a significantly negative coefficient or uh, bright green for a significantly positive coefficient uh, at an alpha level of 0.05 and 0.1. And for example, in this case, uh, the effect that we've labeled here, that is the beta 3 coefficient. And in this case, it's uh, negative 0.61, but it's not significant, it's 0.16. So in that case, it's not significantly different from zero. So it's a yellow color. And we have some others that are actually, for example, negatively uh, significant, like richness of uh, invertebrate species. And some of them are uh, significant and positive, like uh, Parasticopus, that is the, uh, the sea cucumber. Uh, density. So it has significantly increased through time in the reserve as compared to the control site. Right? I'm going to go ahead and hide this just for a while. Actually, this one too. Uh, then for the social economics, we do something similar. Uh, just instead of using the difference in difference to assign these colors, uh, what we use is the, the difference between means of before and after, and that would be basically the, the slope of our regression, um, where we assign in the same way uh, negative colors uh, for orange and, and, and red and positive colors for greens and the intensity of those colors depends on the significance of that coefficient. And for the governance part, as you can imagine, it's a little bit trickier because we don't, we're not running any analysis. So what we did is, for example, if access to the fishery here, it says, great, good job, right? And it's a green color. And this is basically because we know that the access to the fishery is regulated uh, in this case, by permits, quotas, and turfs. And basically, anything that is not open access gets, a, let's call it a plus one value instead of a negative one value, and, and that is something good. Uh, at the same time, for example, these reserves in Isla Natividad are not legally recognized. They are community-based marine reserves. And that's why we flag this uh, in red color, like, well, you know what? Recognizing your, your reserve legally might help you have better enforcement. It might not necessarily be true, but it's at least something that can be changed in, in hope of something better. Now, this uh, scorecard approach is great uh, for sharing uh, information with the community. Uh, they can just take a screenshot of the entire scorecard and pass it around. They get the, the, the perception of how the reserve is working in a glance uh, with some very nice and easy to understand colors. But this is not enough to provide evidence that the reserve has or hasn't worked. Uh, and, and it's not evidence that they can turn into the government agencies and the management agencies. So uh, in order to, to have something more like that, we have this button right here that you can click and it would download a technical report. I'm gonna try to download it right now. And what this is doing is it, it will generate a PDF report with all the indicators that have been selected. And that will include graphs for each indicator and uh, the regression tables or the summary statistics for each uh, analyzed indicator. And as you can see here on the bottom right corner, you have the, the progress bar that tells you how much it is loading. Uh, and there it is. And depending on how your machine works, it might be that uh, you can just uh, choose where to download it or it will be directly sent to the download folder. And this is the PDF that you will get. And so it has a title and it's a report for the La Plana, Las Cuevas, and La Dulce de Avencho in Isla Natividad. And it has a table of contents listing all the uh, indicators that were used. And in this case, these are the ecological indicators or the biophysical indicators, socioeconomic and governance indicators. And uh, we have also included some information about this report because uh, otherwise it would just be a collection of graphs and tables without background understanding. So we've explained uh, how to interpret the, the, the legend in, in, in this red, green uh, colors uh, for the scorecard. Uh, we explain what models are used to estimate all the, the, the effectiveness of the reserve or the changes and how things are done. So we outline that very good in here for all the variables and all the coefficients. And we explain how to read the tables and the figures uh, that are produced. And of course, if there is anything weird about it, uh, we have information on how to let us know and how to report any bugs or any 
uh, any weird things that you might see so that we can go ahead and replicate the error and hopefully fix it. So far, everything has worked, uh, worked fine. So um, at the beginning, we, we represent uh, the, the, the summary of, of all these indicators with the, the little colors as a summary for the beginning of it. And then if you scroll down further, you get to some of the indicators. And in this case, for example, we are, we are looking at uh, fish richness uh, inside the reserve in red and outside or in the control sites in blue, where each point or each dot that you see in the graph is one transect and uh, the black dots represent the mean for each year of those transects. And these are uh, standard error bars that tell us the, the dispersion of this, uh, of this indicator through time. And uh, it sometimes it skips a page if they're too long, like this case, uh, but you also get a regression table for each indicator. And this has all the coefficients for every year, and you know, they're modeled as factors, as I said before. Um, but basically what we're looking into is this effect uh, coefficient, and that is the beta three coefficient. And if you remember, or you recall when I uh, did the app before, it was negative 0.61, and it wasn't significant, so that's why you get this negative 0.61. And we get this the same for each of the indicators that are analyzed. So that is available for all the indicators. Let me scroll down to the socioeconomic because those look a little bit different. So this is what they look like. And of course, in the socioeconomic, we don't have replicate transects or replicates at all. Um, but you still get uh, this information where uh, based on the post variable, so it's a zero if it's before implementation and a one if it's after implementation, and you see how, uh, in this case, this is uh, income from landings in uh, Mexican pesos per year have changed through time. And you see that before the reserve was implemented in 2006, uh, they had a certain level of, of, of income. And after the reserve was implemented, the, the income was different. And the difference is measured here uh, by this variable. All right, let me get out of the PDF and go back to the presentation. All right, so I have prepared just a video on this in case something went wrong, but we can skip over that. I guess it worked. Um, so yeah, just to wrap up of uh, this, uh, we're still working on some improvements that we wanna make to the uh, Marea, uh, but that's gonna be in a sort of 2.0 version where we want to include some maps and um, perhaps some other indicators. But as it is now, it's, uh, it's a great tool and it will be implemented by COVID, by Comunidad de Biodiversidad, uh, to analyze uh, or to evaluate the marine reserves in the Pacific, Gulf of California, and Caribbean uh, that fishers have established. Uh, just last week or a uh, couple of days ago, uh, we had a workshop where we presented this framework and tool to other NGOs and uh, management agencies in Mexico, and I believe some people have come back uh, to this webinar because I saw your names in there, uh, which is great. Um, so we're trying to spread the word on this app that is free to use by anybody that wants to use it. And uh, our greatest win is that it will empower coastal communities because now we can provide evidence that the, reserve, the marine reserves are working or that they're not, if that's the case, uh, to the government and reestablish or redesign the, the marine res reserves that they have established uh, a couple of years back. So before I finalize, I'd like to acknowledge some of the uh, people that made this possible. First of all, the uh, the fishing community of El Rosario and the cooperative uh, that works there, because they were of great, great uh, help uh, depurating and going through the, the list of indicators. Um, so really, they made this possible, uh, but also to the funding agencies, and that includes uh, Conacid, who uh, gave me the scholarship uh, to do my master's at, at the Brent School and PhD now, and uh, the Latin American Fisheries Fellowship Program, of course, at UC Santa Barbara, and the WWF uh, Carlos Slim Foundation Alliance. And uh, thank you very much. I've included here a tiny URL to our ResearchGate project in case you guys wanna look into that and we'll be updating uh, uh, our information in there as, as, as we do updates to Marea and the, and the framework. And you will have also my contact information in here. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Juan Carlos. This was great. Um, 
Okay, so we do have some questions already, and then I wanted to remind everyone how to ask questions. Um, if you can, you can type them into the question panel of the user interface, and then I can re relay them to Juan Carlos, and you can go ahead and, and do that at any time they occur to you. Okay, great. So um, there was a question. This was fairly early on, and it was: Is Maria only designed for no-take MPAs or all types of MPAs? Oh, great question. Uh, it was originally designed uh, for only no-take MPAs, where you're comparing a no-take closure zone against a control site, uh, but it certainly can be used to analyze any other uh, MPA, type of MPA, so as long as, uh, as you keep in mind what the, the interpretation of the coefficients are going to be, if you're comparing a restricted access zone against an open access zone, well then the, the, the coefficient is going to tell you the difference between those two treatments, right? Uh, but it can certainly be used for any type of MPA. Okay, great. Okay, thank you, Juan Carlos. Um, then there was another question from during the presentation. Um, what data are you collecting um, uh, during the underwater fish monitoring? Okay. Uh, well, it's not that we are collecting it. It's that fishers and that have been trained as scientific divers have been collecting it for the last 10 years in some places. Uh, and they follow the, well, depends on the site, but they follow standardized reef check protocols or agata protocols, where they record, uh, in the case of fish, they record fish richness, uh, the abundance of each species, and the size of, the, uh, of each fish to the nearest uh, centimeter, or in five centimeter intervals, that depends on the protocol in the region, if you're using PISCO or reef check or, or something different. But it's basically uh, richness, abundance, and uh, size structures or lengths. Okay, great. Um, another question: the Morea app calculates a multiple linear regression per indicator um, that are usually modeled as factors. Therefore, your number of observations must be large in order for your calculations to be reliable. How many transects would you suggest per site? Can other data gathering methods be implemented? Oh, that's a great one. Um, yes, so it's it's a big uh, model that has, uh, I believe, seven co coefficients, and depending on how many years you have, you're increasing that number of, of coefficients from by, by every year. Uh, so in this case, it depends on the, the, the zone, but usually we use between 16 and 24 transects per site per year. Uh, that usually accounts so that we are not overestimating the model or, or having more coefficients than data points. And that has worked for us. Uh, another thing that I that I should have mentioned before is that if any of the covariates, and these are temperature, visibility, or depth, uh, are not present during the, let's say you've never recorded that information, uh, that's all right, Maria will just drop those uh, covariates because if there is no available data and you have a, a smaller, uh, smaller model in there. And uh, what would I recommend to be a good number? I guess that really depends on your system. Uh, systems that are very diverse, uh, you need many replicates to actually reach that uh, species accumulation plot. Um, but I'd say if you're above 20, most of the times, 20 transects per site per year, uh, provide you a good understanding of the, 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 the fish community or the invertebrate community in there. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and there was a question, uh, when do you think Kobe will implement Marea in the Caribbean? Um, I guess we would need to directly talk to them, but I know that there is interest of uh, doing the evaluation of, of some of these marine reserves as soon as they are done with the uh, yearly monitoring that they have, and this is usually during summer uh, months. So in the next couple months, once the new 2017 data comes in and it's cleaned, uh, they can go ahead and do that. Uh, during the, 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 the building part of this project, we had information from the Caribbean, uh, the Gulf of California and the Pacific side, and we tested the app and the framework uh, with communities from, from the three sites. So we have already used it uh, to evaluate the sites in Maria Elena, if that makes sense to who asked the question. Uh, so we used it for Maria Elena and Ponterrero. Uh, it just, wouldn't, we haven't gone the step further and uh, communicated these results because we were waiting for the new data to come in and that's something that COVID has to do uh, as internally as our organization. Okay, great. And then um, I think a follow-up to that was about how long does implementation take? 
implementation of of the app you mean or uh, yeah so i and um Yes, if you could talk about different aspects of that. It wasn't specified in the question, but just sort of talk about um, get, there's there's a lot of aspects of the time, maybe address some of them, like how long the, the data collection uh, and then entering in the app would take. Yeah. Uh, well, the data collection, it, uh, it depends by side, but usually within a week of, uh, well, at least for the biophysical part of it, within a week of uh, doing four dives a day with a group of eight to 12 per, uh, people, you can get all the transects done. Uh, then it takes a little while to take all that information from the field, uh, field sheets into the computer. Uh, and that's say probably another week in there. Uh, but this is usually something that like monitoring protocols that have every that happen every year have already standardized that, that part. Uh, as for running Marea, it takes, I mean, I've done it in just under one minute with a really fast internet connection. Uh, so long as you have all the data and it's properly clean and formatted, which might be the, the, the largest burden in here. Uh, but running the app itself shouldn't take more than, and this is going to, for a really slow internet connection, shouldn't take more than 10 minutes, if you know what, uh, what you want to get at. So I hope that answers the question. Okay. Um, I'll let them follow up if, if, if it doesn't. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Is there okay? Can this tool accept or analyze gaps in data? Uh, gaps in data. Uh, so whenever they, there's data missing, it's uh, depends. Like for example, if for one year you only have eight transects because there was a storm, you couldn't go out or something. It's okay. Uh, you don't need to have a minimum number of transects per year or something like that. Uh, if there's a missing point in the uh, in the socioeconomic indicator, let's say you don't have income from 2011 because that data was lost or something, it's all right. It would just, uh, of course, it would be over or underestimating, and that depends on on whether the point was positive or negative or higher or lower than. Uh, but there is no problem in that. I mean, you should not encounter any trouble in the computation of the analysis. Uh, but something that is very important is that while Marea provides a good way to do this very fast and very smoothly, uh, it does not replace uh, our interpretation. Uh, we need to be very careful on how we used uh, or, or use the, the results that are produced by Marea and always uh, use our background understanding of the system uh, to, to interpret the results. Okay, great. Um, and there's a question, um, can Marea work Sorry. Hello. Uh, if it does, what con? Sarah, you're breaking up, so um, I'm going to take over for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, okay. okay. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Sarah, okay. you're back. I am back. Sorry. I, where did okay. uh, where did we leave off? Did, were you able to hear my last question? No, I just no. heard Ken Marea, and then it cut off. Uh, Okay, sorry about that. I got a message popping up. My sound went out. Um, so, is Maria able to work without physical indicators such as temperature or depth? Um, and if it can, uh, what sort of confidence is there in in outputs if this isn't inf information yeah. isn't entered? Okay. Um, yeah, it can definitely uh, uh, run the analysis without those indicators. And and actually, if uh, for example, if you if let's say Let's use temperature. Uh, if for some reason, uh, including the temperature would mean uh, that you would lose some of the other data because you have missing observations, it would drop that. Uh, but also, if you have no observation of temperature, depth, or visibility, either of them, uh, that covariate will be dropped from the model and won't be taken into account. Uh, in terms of the confidence of the results, uh, what this, uh, including these co uh, covariates, uh, helps us. Uh, adjust for variances in, in the data uh, that are normally not accounted for. So I'm not saying that because people have done it before, that's the right way to go, but they have done it before. They usually don't account for this. And if it's, if you know that uh, these are things that are not influencing your observations, then you should not worry too much about it. Uh, but we've seen cases where uh, in the same uh, monitoring site, in the same year, a diver falls in one or goes down in one side, and a diver goes in the other side, and they see totally different communities, uh, just because they had a 
few uh, uh, degrees Celsius difference in temperature. So it's something we've accounted for. But if you don't have that, as I said, the variables will be dropped from the model and not included. And of course, you're going to have a model that has a lower fit, but we report all the confidence intervals around all the coefficients and we report uh, the usual the R square value and, um, and describe the model fit. So there's, there's certainly uh, room for interpretation in there, uh, but you shouldn't worry too much if you don't have those, those indicators in there. Okay, great. Okay, thank you, Laura Carlos. Um, let's see. Is Maria just focused on no-take MPAs with fisheries activities? In the socioeconomic indicators, um, I just saw landings, et cetera. Are there other socioeconomic indicators for no-take marine reserves? Um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. OK. OK. Um, so no, it's not only for no-takes uh, marine reserves. It can be used uh, so long as you have basically two different treatments. Uh, let's call it, in this case, we call treatment uh, control and treatment reserve, but you can have treatment uh, snorkeling only and treatment snorkeling, diving, and fishing. And, and you could certainly in include that information. Uh, there are some differences that you would need to do to your data and, and how to store those, those types. In, in this case, uh, since it's designed for this, uh, we ask that the the data uploaded has a reserve or control uh, specification column, uh, but you can just sort of hack your way through it. And we had to do through this because uh, uh, we had to do it that way because in, in the extent to the, that we give other people uh, flexibility, uh, that increases the chances of errors or mistakes that people can make. So we had to sort of narrow it down, uh, but you can certainly sort of uh, uh, replace that column that says instead of snorkeling and snorkeling and fishing and diving, you could replace uh, them with control and reserve sites respectively, and you would be getting the, the difference between those two. And for socioeconomic indicators, we are focusing on, as I said, landings and income from landings, and also alternative uh, livelihoods. And some of the other indicators that might seem to be socioeconomic are on the governance indicators. Uh, and and I know it's sometimes hard to, to, to draw a line between them, but it was basically because in the indicate the socioeconomic indicators, it's data that is coming directly from the fishing activity, and the uh, governance indicators are coming from the community. And some of them also include socioeconomic indicators, things like what is the perceived perce uh, effectiveness of the reserve that is more social, uh, but it's in there because it's asked through the same question and in the end it involves uh, or influences the, the governance of that. And so uh, I'm not sure what the second part of the question was. Could you repeat that to me, Sarah? Oh, I already have removed it. Um, I think it was something about um, only using fisheries data. Yes, it was sort of, are there any other socioeconomic indicators? Oh, there are many. There are yeah. a lot of indicators. Yeah. Uh, a recent work that has, um, I mean, if we had, if that work had been published a year ago, this would have a different taste to it. Uh, it's a Demacia work, and there's a bunch of the super cool governance and socioeconomic people working on it. Uh, Basurto is in there. Uh, Mate Genenalovic is in there. And there's this framework for uh, uh, social ecological systems and how, how governance and socioeconomic indicators uh, are affected by, by conservation. Uh, uh, interventions and of course there's a longer list than that but as I said the the original list that we had was probably four times longer than, than what we have right now and it was trimmed and modified according to what fishers felt was relevant for them uh, and what they wanted to keep track of and also what uh, what what data was available for okay okay great um we have time for a couple more questions I think and uh um, let's see. Oh, so this is a sort of a comment and a question. We, um, WWF uh, South America, are busy with a similar project with the government. Oh, wait, I might not have the, the essay right. But anyway, uh, it was some, somebody with WWF, they're busy with a similar project 
project with government to determine whether our MPAs, both open and closed, are being managed effectively according to agreed objectives, indicators, and targets for governments, for governance, socioeconomics, and ecological. I would like to know what was your greatest challenge getting coastal communities to buy into the model? And they also said, great, great work. <laughs> well, thanks. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard thing. Uh, I think we didn't have the very great challenges because we were working with uh, Kobe, who has a great, super strong relationship with coastal communities. Uh, they, they, they've been working with coastal communities sometimes maybe for 10, 12 years now. Uh, so there's, there's a really strong presence of Kobe. So when we came up with this, hey, we want to develop an app so that you guys can do your analysis by yourselves without depending on either personally from Kobe that sometimes help you do the analysis or uh, from the government, they were welcoming uh, our our ideas. And uh, it's also because with the, the motivation for this work was originally the, the fishing refugia, which is this legal framework in which fishers establish their own reserves or, or they turn community-based marine reserves into fishing refugia. Um, and that, 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 that was a motivation for our project. So we had already the buy-in from the fishing communities because they had seen that uh, having these marine reserves works for them. And of course, we also said, well, if we're gonna do this for fishing refugia, we cannot also do it for uh, core zones within uh, uh, biosphere reserves, which are also uh, a type of no-take zone, uh, at least in Mexico's regulation and uh, community-based marine reserves, right? Because the indicators are the same and the objectives are usually the same. And so we basically had the, the luck of having uh, the help from Kobe. Uh, but I think our, our, at least the, the way we, we, I mean, our, our, our way of saying what we wanted to do and, uh, and how that would benefit them was, well, we're gonna give you a tool, but we're not gonna overimpose a hammer, a hammer on you that you're gonna have to learn to use. You tell us what you want and what sort of tools you wanna use uh, for this. Uh, to do about your, your reserves. So we visited uh, El Rosario, and that's actually the picture that you're looking at right now in the in the welcome screen. Uh, and these are fishers going out uh, for, to fish lobsters. And we spent, uh, I believe, three days with them. We went out fishing for lobsters, uh, which was quite fun. Uh, so we were really uh, getting to know each other, uh, contacting the, the academic side of us through the NGO, which is Kobe, with the fishers and spending time with them and talking to them uh, really goes a long way, uh, rather than just assuming what they want or what they need. Okay, great. Okay, and so the last question, and we've actually got it from a couple of uh, folks. Um, can we add other metrics that, uh, um, than those already customized for Morea? And are there, is it possible to add other indicators if you have them? Yeah. Great question. Um, as I said, we, we will be incorporating some other indicators, things like uh, taxonomic diversity, for example, uh, that we want to, to look into, or uh, functional diversity indices, at least for the biophysical part. Um, so far, you cannot um, include new indicators that are not predefined, because what you do is you uh, upload your raw data to Marea, and Marea will calculate, biomass will calculate, density will calculate all the information in, inside. Uh, and this was basically because we didn't want to make fishers having, uh, or we, we didn't want to force fishers to try to calculate the channel diversity index on an Excel sheet that it's probably 8,000 rows long. So you just upload the raw data and Maria will do that for you. However, what you can do is use uh, basically Maria's guts. Uh, Maria is just a front end to an R studio, uh, to, 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 sorry, to an R package that we developed. Uh, the R package is called MPA Tools. It's not yet on CRAN because we're uh, com uh, completing the documentation to that, and hopefully we'll be submitting that sometime soon to CRAN. Uh, but if you're an R Studio, an R user, uh, you can still install that package uh, through the DevTools version, and it, that is available within our GitHub repository. And uh, in our our guidebook at the very uh, last part of it, there's an appendix on how to install this package and run it from your computer. And what I'm basically getting into is that you can yourself uh, calculate these other metrics that you're interested in, and then just use the functions that we predefined that run the analysis. And basically what our functions do is they take a data frame of 
the calculated indicator and they apply the model that you're suggesting. So if you, you just tell it, this is, for example, a taxonomic distinctivity index, um, it's a data frame, and you tell it's a biophysical index and it will apply the biophysical indicator. Uh, there's certainly, we have to work a lot in fully documenting the package, but if you wanna do that, that's certainly an option. Or if you wanna implement the models uh, elsewhere, you can also do that. Okay, great. Thank you, Juan Carlos. We still have um, several questions we weren't able to get to, and I'm sorry for everyone who who we weren't able to get them. But I can I can provide those questions to you after after the webinar, so you can see what they are. Yeah. And um, your contact information is up there if anybody wants to contact you directly. Mm -hmm. Please um, do. Okay. Well, thank you so much. This was it was great to learn more about Maria, and um, we, we wish you all the best for your future work. And uh, thank you to everyone who's able to attend today. We, we hope you got a lot out of this. Thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you very much, everybody. And uh, oh, before I forget, and if I can just do a shameless plug in here, uh, sure. I don't know if you've heard, but there was a big earthquake in Mexico City a couple of days ago, uh, well, yesterday. Uh, so there are many ways that you can support that. And that's either through the Mexican Red Cross, amazon.com.mx. They have a wish list in there. Uh, so you, if you can support in some way uh, the, the Mexican people, uh, I, I, I really appreciate that too. Okay, that's not shameless at all. That's Thank it. you for bringing <laughs> that up. Okay, all right. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much.